Technology has become an integral part of our daily lives, and yet we still seem to blindly adopt it, seemingly without second thoughts to the potential dangers associated to it. Now, almost on a weekly basis, we see yet another news article that comes out that outlines data breaches that affect millions upon millions of people. This week, it was the NHS's turn, as just yesterday, they were completely obliterated by a cyber attack that utilized some tools stolen from the NSA. Now, we're rarely told that these, these potential risks or consequences will directly affect us. And that makes sense if you think about it. As what respectable for-profit business is going to tell you there's a problem associated with the service, right? Because if, you, if they were to do so, you would simply get up and move your business to one of the thousands of competitors that offer the exact same service, but that haven't made you worry. And I'll be the first one to say that technology is amazing and provides us with some truly incredible benefits from communication to knowledge growth and, and the progression of our species as a whole. But maybe, just maybe, we should reconsider our relationship with it. My aim for this talk today is to give you the full picture and give you this, the other side of the argument that's rarely heard so that you can leave and make a choice on how you want to interact with these things. Now, growing up, smartphones, social media, and so on, were still a relatively new phenomenon. And as such, I'd constantly hear from the news or my parents that there was some kind of, I should have some kind of caution towards these things. There was that classic, don't spend all day looking at the screen, you'll damage your eyesight one. Well, thanks a lot, mum. I still have this thick pair of glasses on my face, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> but it seems that what would have been seen as chronic smartphone addiction just a couple of years ago has become the new social norm. And it's now completely acceptable to spend the entire day with your eyes glued to a screen. And no one will think twice about the potential physical consequences or the effect it's having on things such as our mental well-being and social connections. Perhaps even more worryingly, it seems that this technology is being adopted at a younger and a younger age. Ofcom ran a study that showed about 42% of children aged 5 to 15 have a mobile phone. And GSMA ran another one that showed 70% of children aged 9 to 16 regularly access a mobile phone, although their sample size was relatively small. But now the problem seems to be that these devices have become so integrated with our daily lives that when we do rarely hear about these, these problems, we simply don't care anymore. Tech billionaire Steve Jobs, who I believe single-handedly pioneered the smartphone industry as we know it today, strictly controlled his children's access to, to, the, to technology. He seemed to practice, as one of my favorite rappers, Biggie Smalls, would say, never get high on your own supply. If one of tech's biggest names denied his children access to technology he invented, doesn't that tell you something? What effect are these things having on our lives? So before the talk began, the audience was asked if you own a smartphone or not. And I predicted 90% of you will say, would have said yes, and I would have said 100%, but I didn't want to look like too much of a fool if I was completely off. An astonishing 95% of you answered yes, you do indeed own one, which anyone involved in statistics will tell you is incredibly high. Now, smartphones have also aided in the explosion of the of this popularity of social, uh, social media services. And they present us, and I personally have friends all across the world, and these services truly help me keep in contact with them, even if it is just a quick message or picture every now and then. But I often find myself being sidetracked and spending far much longer on these services than I initially intended to inherently doing nothing but scrolling through meaningless junk. And this to me is a problem, because it means that these services have power over me to keep me controlled and occupied, even though I, though I know they've been built to do exactly that. Now, it's no secret that these services apply sneaky psychological tricks in order to not only keep you on there as long as possible, but so that you keep going back in the future. And the main trick is to use numbers absolutely everywhere from notifications to number of friends, contacts, likes, shares, wherever you look, you'll be completely swamped by them. Now, due to the wonders of capitalism, we've been programmed to chase these numbers. And studies show that social media has sim similar effects on our brains as a cocaine high. Now, these services present themselves as something that's being helped, built to help you out, and that they're doing you a favor. However, if we, if, take, if we take a step back and think about this, 
These are services that have billions upon billions of users, which translates into vast costs. And yet the companies that run them are also worth billions upon billions of dollars, with some of them being amongst the highest valued in the world. Have you ever wondered why that is? How is a company that provides a service completely free of charge acquire so much wealth? And the answer is simple. It's all of you. You see, the way, the way, the way these companies generate revenue is, by, is through the use of advertising. Let's call the place where the ads appear the platform. Companies pay the platform to display their ads with the hopes that the users that see them will purchase the, the service or product being, being advertised. Simple enough. However, if you're anything like me, the only reason you've ever clicked on an ad online is because, number one, you've been flat out deceived, or number two, you were trying to close the, the window and you missed. <laughs> and this, shows, this, this is a huge problem for the advertising industry, as why would you invest your hard-earned money into a system that doesn't work? And this is where it starts to get interesting. So the platform's value is the ability to target users that are not only likely to click on the ad with an authentic want, but they are also likely to actually purchase the product at the end of it. And this means that the more, pla more the platform knows about you, the more, the more it can specifically uh, target you, the more value it has to the advertising. And in return, by sharing increasing amounts of data with, these pl with the platform, they can target you better based on your wants and needs. So how do they actually do this? Well, these companies analyze your data in order to create a, a kind of profile with all of your interests and what, what you react to. Now, this began simply by, say, analyzing the users and pages that you liked and, and followed. But once they could accurately do that, they, they began expanding what they analyzed. And nowadays, just about everything you do on these services is tracked, from your supposedly private messages to the amount of time you spend looking at each post, even to, to where your mouse is hovering. They go as far as knowing what time you wake up and go to sleep at in, in, on any given day due to the first and last use of your mobile device. Now you can test this yourself. Have a discussion with a friend of yours over one of these services about something you've never discussed before and see how the adverts change after a matter of hours or days in order to reflect this. So the problem is here that we seem to be forgetting just how much information we share as we add it bit by bit in what I like to call data crumbs. Sure, that one picture you upload doesn't say a lot, but don't forget that this information com is combined. And when it is, it provides an incredibly in-depth picture into your life. And it, sh it comes complete with pictures, videos, and commentary from you in the form of comments and messages. Don't forget that this includes things like your, your life problems, the affairs you're having, the possible illegal acts you're have, you've, you've committed, as well as that suspicious red rash you had in your private parts that you Googled the symptoms for. <laughs> and we also seem to be forgetting that these, private, uh, these companies are privately run, and we have little or no control over them in terms of government regulations and laws. We take it completely for granted that CEOs are currently interested in making money. But what would happen if one of those CEOs was secretly incredibly racist? or the head of ad policy was a huge homophobe and they wanted to spread their ideology. These two people can affect the thinking of billions upon billions of people, and yet we have absolutely no say in who gets appointed. This problem becomes even more sensitive if you consider the huge advertising budgets that, say, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton had for social media advertising, as well as the both sides of the Brexit argument. Now, the thing is that these companies are starting to realize just how powerful they are, and they're beginning to test the water to see just how much they can do. In 2012, Facebook was outed for running psychological experiments on unwitting users to see if they could, if, if they could affect their moods in a positive or negative way, with which they were apparently extremely successful. And just a couple of weeks ago, they were, they were outed in yet another scandal where they were identifying children as young as 14 who were feeling overwhelmed, defeated, and useless via progress in their sentiment analysis capabilities, which is basically their ability to extract emotions or what you're feeling from the content you upload. Now, let's not, not forget that this is the company that's pioneering advancements in, in artificial intelligence, which is basically computers that can think for themselves. 
Now, I wanted to avoid the tinfoil hat conspiracy theories, but let's just take a second to think about this. What if Stephen Hawking is correct and AI is inherently evil? We've just handed it the ability to target vulnerable children. And if they can affect users' moods in a both positive and negative way, then it's not too far-fetched to consider that they can target people that might harm themselves and push them to do that, or maybe even commit suicide. Suddenly, Facebook employees became that much more powerful. Now, we're truly, we're entering, a, 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 we're truly entering an era of the unexplored, as, you, as we don't know the consequences of, the, of putting so much data online. When, when data leaves your phone, you simply don't know what's happening to it, who has access to it, or even how many people can see it. And let me warn you, we're entering a, a period of time where it's more valuable and sometimes even cheaper to store your data instead of delete it. And it's actively being used to train modern systems such as artificial intelligence and sentiment analysis. No one sits and reads the terms of service that we all rush to click agree on because it consists of thousands of pages of legal gibberish. But if you could understand what they said, I doubt you'd use the service due to what they disclosed. Or maybe at this point, you simply wouldn't care anymore. Now, I'm not focused on Facebook, but believe me, they're, they're only the beginning of the problem. Microsoft's Windows 10 operating system is notoriously intrusive and shares just about everything you do on it with Microsoft and its trusted partners by default. Who they are is anyone's guess. So Apple's Siri, the voice commands you, you send it, uh, are all uploaded to Apple's servers for analysis in, and in order to improve the accuracy of the service. How long they keep those for, again, no one knows. Popular music identification app Shazam constantly leaves your Mac's microphone on even when the app is disabled. But supposedly now, they don't process that data. Barack Obama was recently quoted as saying, I mean, it is true. If you had pictures of everything I'd done when I was in high school, I probably wouldn't have been president of the United States, with a cheeky chuckle. And continues to say, so I would advise all of you to be a little more circumspect about your selfies and what you take pictures of. If the big man Barrio himself, the father, <laughs> for the father of the modern surveillance state, is telling you to be careful with your pictures of your private parts and moments, maybe you should listen. But now, see, the problem is that I'm not telling you to denounce all things tech and go completely off the grid. But I'm, all I'm saying is that moving forward, we'll be sharing more data, and as we do so, it becomes more sensitive. As we've seen, all of this data is also at risk. We're already sharing biometric data with our phones, such as face scans and fingerprints, in order to unlock them, as well as some basic medical data. But if this data gets stolen, it's permanent. As no one says, realistically says, oh, I'll just pop down to the plastic surgeon for a quick password change, right? And there's an old Islamic saying that fits perfectly here. Trust in Allah, but tie up your camel. Have faith in these services, but protect yourself against the worst. So you might be sat there thinking, okay, I've said all these things, so what would I suggest you do? The first thing I suggest is that you take back control of your devices. Use them because you want to, not because they want you to. Something as simple as disabling your lock screen notifications and vibrations for things like instant messaging and social media can truly help out, as well as disabling your battery percentage, as you can eyeball it and really don't need to know exactly what percentage it's at. Just these two things can hugely reduce the amount of stress in your life and the amount of time you spend looking at these devices. Go through your settings on social media accounts and make everything as private as possible. You really won't miss out on anything and your friends will still be able to find you. A big problem is the apps ask for access to, for example, your media library. But that one click gives that app fully uncontrolled access to all of your pictures and videos as long as it's installed. What's worse is there's absolutely no indication as to when these things are being accessed. And the same goes through your microphone, camera, and GPS services. You can say no to these apps, and they continue to work absolutely fine. Instead of saving that image, send yourself the URL and save it safe on your computer. Be suspicious. Go through your list of all of the, all the installed apps on your phone and disable access to things they shouldn't have. If you can be bothered to, 
turn off all this access each time you stop using the app. I know it sounds tedious, but it's something that you need to be doing in order to keep yourself secure. Important, we have something very important is to use multiple personas online. Use one for social media, one for commerce, and one for your professional life, with a different email address for each of them. The point here is to, is to allow these companies to track as much data as they can with you. That's gonna, that's gonna happen whether you like it or not. But the point here is to make it anonymous and not be, be able to, to link it back to you. And it's very important also to clear your history and restart your browser before changing between these personas, as cookies will link you to, to, to each other much more than you know. Google provides resources to billions of websites on the internet. And every time you load one of these sites, they know you've been there. So suddenly, visiting all those dodgy sites isn't as funny anymore when it's linked to your professional email address. Download specialized software such as CCleaner to clear all that junk for you. Install ad blockers to hugely reduce the, the tracking capabilities of these services. And most importantly, don't use your real name, especially in your email address. Transgender people have struggled for years for the right to use alternative names on these services. And now a lot of sites accept pseudonyms. Take advantage of this. But there's a problem here. You have to have some kind of trade-off, as you still have to trust someone, such as your device manufacturer. But what I've proposed here is aims to hugely improve your online privacy, as perfect privacy is not, is not possible. Even if you apply just a couple of the steps that I've, I've, pr I've proposed, you'll hugely improve your situation. And if you're sat there feeling horrified and violated, good, I'm glad, because these companies need to hear that you, this, the way they're acting is unacceptable, and that they need to change. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you learned something today.